Well, good morning. Welcome to uh, Life Point Mount Vernon. I should be welcoming myself because this, this is only the second time I've ever been here. So I'm Pastor Jeff. I'm one of the pastors from down at the Lewis Center campus. And for those of you that's expecting Pastor Adam, I'm sorry to disappoint. Um, yesterday he called me and he was kind of 50 50 and maybe under the weather a little bit. And he's kind of like, I don't know and if I can go today. And there's a scripture that says uh, that we're to be instant in season and out of season. And so I said, yeah. So uh, that's why I'm here with you this morning. So I heard that there, through the grapevine that there was a football game last night, and I hope that uh, kind of turned out well for you. And hopefully you guys all have had a good Thanksgiving and everybody is just smoothly, smooth as silk transitioning into Christmas, right? Right? So with Christmas being only 17 days away, it seemed fitting to me to just dive into the Gospel of Luke chapter 1 to study a portion of the birth narrative of Jesus. Now, the kids uh, quoted scripture from the birth narrative of Jesus, and I thought they did an exceptional job this morning with the music and with the, with the passages in Luke. And so we're going to dig into another uh, portion uh, of that birth narrative. Now, we're not going to dig into the manger in Bethlehem part as much as we're going to look at the nine months or so prior to when the angel Gabriel shows up in the town of Nazareth at the home of a teenager by the name of Mary, and he has this special message to deliver. It's this unique promise of a son. And so in our culture, starting off, Mary would seem like a super unlikely candidate to be the mother of Jesus, which for me is a major indicator in this story that God's at work. You know, I find the conversation in the scriptures between Gabriel and between Mary, I find them remarkable. And I think that, that somewhere hidden underneath is the portrait of what true biblical faith could and should look like. And so I encourage you, if you've got a copy of the scriptures this morning, open them up to Luke chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 26, and we're just going to take this verse by verse. Um, and so the birth narrative story opens up in verse 26 with God sending the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. So let's stop right there. And this, is, this story already, it's beginning with this major plot twist, I think, from the get-go. Because if you, if you take the city of Nazareth, don't think Columbus. Um, think more like stick town. Um, and I equate Nazareth as this Galilean equivalent of my hometown of South Point, Ohio. It's small town, southern Ohio, very strong Appalachian culture. You could probably tell that already by my accent. The sad thing about it is I've lived in Central Ohio for 30 years. So, um, But, you know, it's, it's kind of like being from South Point. It was like being from the sticks. And uh, similarly, in Jesus' day, if you were a resident of Nazareth, you were looked down upon. And the messianic expectations in Jesus' day, they were running high and they were causing people to pose questions like, now how is it possible that Israel's would-be Messiah could be from Sticktown, Nazareth, and not from the big metropolis of Jerusalem? And in fact, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, there's this guy by the name of Nathaniel, and when he's told where Jesus, the would-be Messiah, hailed from, his response was, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? And then to throw gasoline onto the fire, one would suppose that Gabriel has got the wrong young lady, a virgin at that, the, the wrong candidate to bring the Christ child into the world, seeing how that Mary was engaged, but yet she was unmarried. And so we got this drama unfolding with the most unlikely person in the most unlikely town getting ready to receive the most unlikely promise of a son. But Mary of Nazareth, 
She seems to be God's sovereign choice, and who can argue with that? Because this is precisely how God is going to orchestrate His plan of redemption by bringing Christ into the world. And so we got this interaction that opens up with the angel Gabriel's greeting. And I think it defines for Mary and it defines for us, the readers, what it means to be a recipient of God's favor. So check out Gabriel's opening line in verse 28. Gabriel says this to Mary. He's like, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, we don't use that term favor much anymore in our everyday lingo. It's kind of relegated itself to a religious term. And it implies that we're just going to have all kinds of good things happen to us since we become Christians because what we do is we equate favor with blessing. And let me remind you that you can be favored by God and you can be on a donkey fleeing to Egypt in fear for your child's life because your baby's got a price on his head. In fact, Mary and Joseph and Christ child Scholars believe that they traveled 460 miles in their first four years together on foot and on the back of a donkey. They start off by going from Nazareth to Bethlehem to where Jesus is born due to the census. And then they go to flee from Herod, who wants to kill Jesus. They go into the nation of Egypt. Once the danger subsides, they leave Egypt. And it's back on that donkey, back on foot, back up to Bethlehem, and finally they land in Nazareth where Jesus ultimately grows up. And, and here's the point this morning. I think that the favor, it never means that all of your wildest dreams are going to come true as Christians. But what it does mean is it's, it means exactly what verse 28 says it means. It means that the Lord is with us. And this morning... We're guaranteed, you and me, that if we're Christians, just like Mary, that the Lord is with us at all times. And so notice in verse 29, Mary's reaction. And it isn't that she reacts to Gabriel's appearance, but the Scripture says she reacts to his his saying. Now, regarding his appearance, I don't think that Gabriel had this white flowing robe on and that he was levitating off of the ground, and he has this halo on top of his head, and he's got these gigantic white wings that are are sprouting off of him. And you can see in the rendition and and, and this old painting that's from the 16th century, I mean, even the depiction of Gabriel at the bottom left, see those little tiny wings? The point being is I don't think artists can, can figure out what the appearance of an angel looks like. And when you look at the original language of the New Testament, that term angelos can also be interpreted as messenger. And so what troubled Mary, it wasn't this greeting. It was the messenger's message. Do you get that? It was the saying and, and, and verse 29, and I, don't want you to, I don't want you to miss this because this saying is what greatly troubled Mary. And yet, she tries to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And don't read over this detail like I've read over it before in the past because in this moment, this opening moment of interaction with the messenger of God, remarkably, this young teenager, this teenage virgin... She keeps her cool, and she tries to discern, she tries to understand, she tries to comprehend and make sense of Gabriel's greeting. And and this is the point that I'd like for you to consider this morning. And that's this, the Christian faith, it begins by engaging our minds. And it, it begins by thinking, and it begins by reasoning, but As we're going to see later, it doesn't end there, but we've got to start somewhere. And you know, for the Christian, I think biblical faith, it's always an informed leap. I mean, we're never asked to believe in something that doesn't have, that there's no good reason to believe in it. For for Christians, it's doing what I call the mental math by looking at our past to be able to pinpoint specific instances to where God's been faithful to us. 
And then it stands to reason that if he's been faithful to us in our past, then he must be worthy of our future trust. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, you might be asking yourself, well, Pastor Jeff, it's like, what would engaging my mind look like? Why should I trust in Jesus if I've got no guarantee that he's going to solve all my problems? And I would just say, consider this. You show me any religion or any religious ideology where at its heart is a God that is so in love with humanity that he would do this for. Jesus says in John chapter 15, and he's speaking about himself, he says, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And certainly he's speaking about the cross that uh, he's marching toward. And point to me any other God that would enter into the human condition to defeat the forces of evil by paradoxically allowing evil to defeat him. You show me anyone who's more amazing and more compassionate and more committed to humanity, more inclusive than Jesus. And I think Rather than say, well, why should I follow Jesus this morning? I think the best question to be asking is, how can we not follow this man? And thus, Christian faith, it's an informed leap. Yeah, and it begins by engaging our minds, but it's also, it's a leap ahead, which leads Gabriel to speak of Mary's future in the next few verses. Look what Gabriel says in verse 31. He says, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And notice that there's a lot of repetition in this verse, and it's the words will and it's the word shall. And so it's time for a pop quiz this morning. Everybody gets to participate. I'll be the one given the grade. So the topic's going to be English grammar. Yay. Yay. So what tense are the words will and shall? Are they, are they past tense? Are they present tense? Or are they future tense? Future. Good. You all got an A. See how easy that was? Future tense. They're always used with base verbs. They're used to predict or state facts about the future. So they're future tense. And you're like, so what? Why does this matter? And I think it matters because Mary is being asked to trust in God in a way that makes no sense in light of her present circumstances. I mean, here's this, here's this inexperienced teenager, and, and she's a virgin and yet she keeps an open mind, and how, how does she do this? How does she, how does she choose not to allow her present circumstances to define who God is to her? You know, present circumstances, they often serve to undermine our trust in God. They often serve to undermine our loyalty to Him, and often they serve to undermine how we think of him. And yet the future, not the present, is what Mary is being asked not only to believe in, but to participate in. As you remember earlier in the verses we read, when it comes to the present, the only mention of the present was what, what was that Mary was highly favored and God is with her. But in these verses that we just read, Mary receives a word from God about what she could live for if, if she trusts in him more than her present circumstances. And so Gabriel's pitch to Mary, it's meant to convince her, I believe, that God is taking this world someplace in the birth of Jesus, that he's moving the world towards renewal and restoration. And if that's truly where God is taking the future, then doesn't it make sense to exercise faith in the present? And don't miss the fact that Mary's being asked to overlook her present circumstances and that she's being asked to to trust 
that Christian faith only makes sense in light of the future. Or to put it differently, Christian faith's about living in the present as if the future's already arrived. And I know that at a gathering of this size, there's some difficult circumstances that some of you are dealing with this morning. And I'm not trying to make light of that in, in any way. But there are times when our circumstances, they're so overwhelming and sometimes they're so bleak that the only way that we can endure them is to look ahead of them. And when the circumstances arise that call for us as Christians to turn the other cheek with somebody we love because they've offended us or hurt us, or when we're called to pray for our enemies, I mean, why bother doing that if you don't believe that the Christ child that's promised to marry is returning one day to set up a future reign of a kingdom that's never going to end? And a Christian faith, if it only makes sense in light of the future, here's, here's an applicable question for you. Like Mary, is God asking you this morning to identify like one area of your life where exhibiting faith makes no sense in lieu of your present circumstances? And can you turn it over to Him because of where God's taken the world in the future? You know, maybe it's an area of forgiveness. Maybe it's an area of self-gratification. Maybe it's an area of finances. But is God saying, yeah, turn that area of your life over to me, not because of what you're walking through right now, but because of where God is taking, taking the world in the future. So, What's it going to be, Mary? Are you going to pass or are you going to play? How's she going to react to this unprecedented information that this young lady is being asked to be the mother of the King of kings and the Lord of lords? And you know, before she commits, she doesn't say, oh, Gabriel, I'm too young to be a mother. She doesn't say, now, Gabriel, you know that I'm not married yet. She simply asked this brief open-ended question. Verse 34, and Mary says to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answers her, the Holy Spirit, Mary, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, I think that Gabriel's answer for me and probably for Mary, it defies all human logic. I mean, the virgin birth redefined everything that Mary knew up to this point, and yet remarkably, she remains open to the possibility. And then to top it off, she's got to make room in her life for all the ridicule and the gossip that's going to come from Nazareth, because you know Sticktown, everybody knows everybody's business in Nazareth. And all of a sudden, people are going to be talking behind her back because she's carrying a child perceived to be conceived out of wedlock, and that's going to result in all kinds of snide remarks. So what's Mary do? What she doesn't do is ask for a sign. She doesn't ask for, for a sign to move her toward commitment. And I can tell you right now, man, if I would have been in Mary's shoes, I would have been begging. I would have been pleading for some kind of sign. God, give me some confirmation if you want me to be all into this thing that's blowing my mind. And even though that she doesn't ask for a sign, the Scripture teaches us that she's given one. And she's given this sign as evidence that God's moving that he's taken this world someplace. And not only is he taken it someplace with, with this unique promise that she's going to give birth to a son, um, but there's also another unique promise that's being made. There's another son that's come on the scene because earlier in the chapter, Luke 1, verses 5 through 25, is another birth narrative, and that birth narrative is about a couple by the name of Zacharias and Elizabeth, and they get instructed to name their son. They name their son John, and you know him. You know him as John the Baptist. 
Look at what Gabriel says in verse 36. He says, And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. Now, obviously Mary's not old. Obviously, even though Mary's a virgin, she's not, she, she's not barren. She's able to, to have children. So what's this all about? And then don't miss this little phrase that most of us have memorized and we've used over and over when it comes to difficult circumstances. Because verse 37 says, for nothing is impossible with God. And this for nothing is impossible with God. This isn't the first time that this appears in the Bible. It also is found way back in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis chapter 18, and Jewish readers of of Luke's gospel, they would have certainly picked up on this, but this is about the story of Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah is Israel's matriarch, and I liken her to the her to the Martha Washington of Israel. As she's barren her entire life, and yet she gets this promise that she's going to have a son of the covenant, and she's in her 90s when she gets this promise. And what's remarkable is God, through his messenger in the Abraham and Sarah story, He uses a messenger just like he's using a messenger, Gabriel, with Mary. He's used another messenger to proclaim to Sarah the same phrase, for nothing is impossible with me. And and, and so what what he's doing is he's, he's bringing Sarah to faith when she replied to the messenger that she was too old to bear a son. And So now Mary gets this confirmation by having Gabriel use that same line from the Abraham and Sarah story, and nothing is impossible with God, as if to say, see, Mary, we got that covered. We've been here before with Sarah, and now currently your relative Elizabeth, who's up in years and is barren, she's also going to have a son. So see, Mary... If I did it again, do the mental math. If I did it 1,500 years ago for Sarah, you can trust me. And so now, Mary, what's it going to be? Are you going to pass or are you going to play? And for me, this whole interaction between Gabriel and Mary, it boils down to two things. Number one, can God's creativity be trusted? You know, Abraham and Sarah's son of the promise gets born to Abraham when he's 100 years old. And like we said earlier, Sarah's in her 90s. And if God can defy human biology like that, then why can't he creatively do the virgin birth? Secondly, not only can his creativity be trusted, but can his timing be trusted? And what's interesting here is 700 years prior to to Mary and Gabriel, we have the prophet Isaiah who writes to the nation of Israel in Isaiah chapter 7, verse, verse 14. He writes, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign, Israel. And listen to the sign. A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Matthew interprets in the birth narrative to Jesus what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel means God with us. And if if God can prophetically reveal his plan 700 years ago, why can't he orchestrate it into reality whenever he chooses? And you know, I don't know about you this morning, but when I pray my prayers to God, I can I can pray fervently when I'm in some present circumstances up to my eyeballs that are challenging. When the adversity comes, I can really do me some praying. And I'm all about God's creativity. I mean, God, love your creativity. Any way that you can bless this mess that I've caused, bring on all the creativity you can bring on. Have at it. But boy, when it comes to timing, 
That's another story for me. Because when I pray my prayers and I'm in the throes, you know when I want it? You know when I want the answer? I I want it now. I want the answer yesterday. And I've learned in my discipleship throughout the years that God doesn't always give me what I want now. And I'm not saying, and don't hear me wrong, don't take this out of context, don't go home and say, Pastor Jeff said that God doesn't do anything instantaneously anymore because that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying, yeah, I believe in His instantaneous miracles. Yeah, I believe in His miracle working power, but I also need to learn as a disciple of Jesus that I need to trust in the slow work of God. I think we would all do well to be able to trust His timing, bring our issues to the Lord, and trust in His creativity, yeah, but also trust in His timing. Look at what Mary says in verse 38 to all of this through the the last few verses. Mary kind of sums things up like this. She says, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. End of story. Good story? Yeah, it's a good story. But I don't believe it's the final, the end, because to me, I think yet maybe the most important characteristic of Christian faith is found right here in verse 38, and that is that Christian faith is always, always, always linked with obedience. And the reason I say that, if you believe this morning that God's taken our world somewhere, that he's truly moving it towards renewal and restoration in Christ. And doesn't it make sense to obey in the present? And your Christian faith, it becomes real when it's backed up with action. But it's abstract until it becomes a choice that we make. Yeah, it begins, like we said earlier, with thinking, it begins with discernment, it begins with reasoning, but unfortunately for most Christians, that's exactly where it ends. It ends there, it never becomes action, it lies dormant, it lies abstract, it's just some kind of an idea that floats around in our heads. And to truly see Jesus for who He is which is way more than this idea in your head, what actually causes him to come alive is following him. And you know, you could spend most of your adult life trying to figure out what the truth is about Jesus, what the truth is about the Bible, the theology of specific churches or denominations, but in everyday life, Jesus becomes real to us. When we reject the instincts that comes natural to us as humans, and we start making decisions that seem crazy to us, but they're the decisions of following the way of Jesus through the Holy Spirit, and then all of a sudden, Jesus becomes not just this idea floating around in our heads anymore, but He becomes a presence, and He becomes a reality to us. I say to you this morning, this is the way that Jesus becomes Emmanuel, which is God with us. It's when we obey His teachings and act on them. And so you know how the story ends. Thankfully, Mary chose play. And she even uses a little witty word play herself. Because in verse 38, if I could paraphrase it for you, I believe that what she's saying to to God through Gabriel, the messenger, is, God, since you gave me your word, I'll give you my word. In verse 38, Mary says again, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And think about that response for just a minute. I was looking through study Bibles, and I've got a boatload of study Bibles at home, and I'm looking for a reference that's going to take me from that, that saying, Behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. It's going to maybe refer, refer me to another place in Luke's gospel, and that's Luke chapter 22. 
And that happens to be the chapter to where the story of Jesus, he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane the night that he gets arrested. And, you know, it's a supercharged night, and most of you know the story. Those of you that are Bible readers, you know that, that on that night that Jesus prays, and you know the words that he prayed. He says, Father, he says, let this cup pass from me. He prays his prayer three times. And finally, the third time that he prays it, he comes around to this phrase, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So I ask you this morning to consider this. Where do you, where do you think he heard that prayer? Who taught him that prayer? I don't have any scripture to back this up, so I'm going to go out on a limb here because it's a really good teaching and preaching point. And that, and that is, I, you, we can only speculate that the young boy Jesus heard his mother telling the story to him over and over about her encounter with Gabriel and how she submitted to God's will. You know, there's a saying in southern Ohio that says the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. And I just think it's, it's fascinating that mother and son's response to testing is just strikingly similar. Mary says, I'm your servant. Let it be to me according to your word. Jesus says in the garden, Father, let the cup pass, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so... I want to land the plane this morning, and, and I, w- I want to do it by, by with this, leave you with this final thought. Because, you know, I, I think that our text, it, it presents Mary as an exemplar, that she's this positive example of discipleship that all Christians can model themselves and should model themselves after. And, you know, granted, there's different faith traditions, and they've, they've deified Mary. They've made her out to be godlike. And yet, I believe that the gospel authors are emphasizing that she's a participant in a much larger story. And it's not Mary's story, but it's God's story. And that this was God's plan all along, and he's orchestrating this plan to renew his good world through the birth of his son, Jesus And if you still got a copy of your scriptures handy, I'd like for you to stay in Luke chapter 1 and then look at verses 46, chapter 1, verse 46. Maybe your Bible has a heading. I'm reading out of the NIV right now. My Bible has a heading that says Mary's song. Some of you might have the Magnificat. Some of you might have Mary's poem. But this is this is what Mary says, and and she's 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 reciting this poem to God the Father, she says, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Did you catch that? My spirit rejoices in who? In God my Savior. And then she goes on, For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. You know, we're not going to be able to read the rest of that, that song, but I think in that opening stanza, Mary recognizes and she puts into words her need, that she has a need for a Savior. And she clearly sees that her role in this story is primarily as an obedient servant, nothing more. And so if Mary, the mother of Jesus, recognizes her need for a Savior, then how much more do we need the Savior that we celebrate on Christmas who's Christ the Lord? So as we close this morning, this part of the service, I'd like for you to just close your eyes, bow your heads for just a a quiet moment to just take time to reflect upon who Jesus is to you and to reflect on about what he came into the world to do for us. And you know, if you're not in right standing with the Lord this morning, if you're not a Christian, I hope that you take this opportunity to confess your sins and confess Jesus of your, 
as your Savior because there's no better time and there's no better place than to do that now. And if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, you know, it can be done by praying a simple prayer silently. And if you want to, if you want to pray that prayer, you could consider praying something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize my sin cost you your life. I confess all my sin, past, present, and future. And I recognize the only way that I can be saved is through your death on the cross and your resurrection. So before we get into our time of baptism this morning, I'd just like to close in the short prayer. Jesus, we are just, uh, we marvel at your beauty. You are the Son of God that entered into, you embodied uh, flesh, came into this world as a servant. And the scriptures teach in Philippians chapter 2 that you humbled yourself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, and that it ends with wherefore God highly exalted you. We lift up your name this morning. We've lifted up your name in songs. We've lifted up your name in scripture. We've lifted up your name, Lord, in, in teaching. And now, Lord, we get an opportunity to lift up your name in baptism. So it's been good, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, I pray these things, and amen.